Ladies and gentlemen, dear old friends, dear new friends, dear guests, this is a place to be this afternoon. This is Roundtable One session. Let us discuss emerging perspectives for transforming the built environment. But the first, I'd like to welcome you, Ni Hao, Strastwitje, Bomdia, Cesch, Ahoy, and so on. I'm not able to say welcome to you in all of your beautiful languages, so please take your slide and select your own language. But in any case, a warm welcome to all of you. But I invite you also later on to take part in an online voting. So be prepared to use the mobile app of this conference. Later on, I will ask you three questions because I like to use the opportunity to ask 1,800 experts from all over the world and we will see and we will wait for your answers. But at first, I like to come back to the main four topics of this conference, deep building renovation, high performance building, community empowerment, and more sustainable neighborhoods. These are the main topics. And during our roundtable discussion here, we will come back to such areas. If you look around the world, it looks like a firework. Every day, new topics. Every day, new campaigns. Every day, new ideas. What does it mean? And so we can also ask ourselves, how sustainable is it to deal with sustainable development if we have every day another campaign? And if we look behind the horizon, the next topics are waiting already. So in future, perhaps we will discuss topics like regenerative sustainability or smart cities or resilience. We have heard about this already a lot this morning. But now, to discuss all such questions, we invited four famous speakers to take a place on a hot chair here on stage. In a certain way, we will take a look into the future. Of course, future is unpredictable, but we will try our very best to have a look into the future, to identify some trends and some scenarios, and we will discuss what does it mean to all of us. So in a certain way, we will have the chance to look to four different perspectives, different perspectives taking into account the very special field of expertise of our four speakers here, representing powerful international organizations, representing national organization, representing praxis in construction and design, and finally also representing activities in teaching and research. We will listen to four presentations, and may I introduce now our four speakers. I'd like to invite to stage to take place at first in this beautiful white hot chair, our first speaker, Yi Xiang Tai, Chairman of World Green Building Council. Please come and please welcome our first speaker. Our second speaker will be Yu Bai Wang, Chairman, China Green Building Council. Dear colleague, please come, take a seat. I'd like to welcome Brian Liu, Vice Chairman of Ronald Liu and Partners. A warm welcome, Brian. And there's one speaker more, Professor Arno Schlüter, ETH Zürich, Professor for Architecture and Building Systems. But he is also a chair in a Future Cities Laboratory in Singapore. So please come. So these are our 
four speakers, and later on we will go through the presentations one by one. But at first, I like to invite now you. Please answer some short questions. Please use your mobile, and on the mobile you will find a function ready to answer some questions. I hope you are well prepared. You are here with uh, question number one. Should sustainable construction be focused on climate protection in the future, or should it continue to include all environmental, economic, and social aspects? So option A is you should for a while mainly focus on climate protection, or, and this is option B, this shall include all dimensions of sustainable development, so also in future, we will not just deal with the aspect of climate change, but we will take into account all the three dimensions, the environmental, economic, and social aspects. So please vote A or B if you are able to make a choice. Okay? Vote now. And I move to question number two. How should the function and purpose of sustainability assessment of buildings change over the next 10 years? There's option A, no change necessary. It will remain more or less voluntary and used primarily for large projects as it is now. Or banks and insurance companies should provide incentives. This is option B. Or public authorities should provide incentives, option C or public authorities should incorporate this into codes and regulations. This is already the case in some countries, so please vote now, A, B, C, or D. <laughs> Somebody will help you to find this in your smartphone. <coughs> <laughs> it's under the headline of round table one in your mobile phone using the app of this conference. So inside the mobile phone, if you are well prepared, there is this app and there is one in the agenda called round table one and there you will find all the questions. There. So if you are able just to find question one, please answer question one, and later on we will come back to the other questions during the discussion. Let us see. If you are interested to see question number three, this was a question, but we can come back to this during discussion. It doesn't matter. Okay? So I hope you are able to answer Question number one, and for all the other things, no problem. So, the most important thing, of course, are the ideas of our colleagues. And you have heard about the idea of Roundtable One. Today, we will create and collect some ideas, and tomorrow, our colleagues from Roundtable Two will start to translate this into actions. And so, later on, I will come back to you to inform you how it goes further tomorrow. From my point of view, we are ready now to listen to the first presentation. And so I like to invite my colleague, Yi Xiang, to start his presentation. So please take the clicker. And I hope we will see soon your slides. And please start your presentation. Do I stand here? Okay. It's up to you. Okay. Well, uh, very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, friends, many old friends, in fact. Let me firstly thank HKGBC for having me here. And every time I said I come here, I feel like a second home. And I'm sure some of you are familiar with World GBC. I'm the current chair. Uh, and I think it's useful for me to also share with you, especially those of you who don't know what we do. And we know that green buildings uh, offer one of the most cost-effective solutions to climate change and can lead to significant 
environmental, economic and social benefits, which is actually where the questions are leading us to. And with this intention, World GBC was established uh, in 2002. And in the short 15 years, we have grown to 75 country members today. I think this is uh, something that is uh, very significant. Oh, can I go back? This is very significant for a small organization that is now impacting the world. I often describe it as the greatest green building movement in the history of mankind because throughout history there is no such movement and we have started it together with all of you and we must finish this uh, mission. So in the past 15 years we learned a lot and in the more recent strategic review we developed a few key strategies. Amongst them are written here and I will share with you especially about the first two strategies about better places for people and advancing net zero on the right of the screen. And I also would like to take this chance to share some concern about the issues of city and communities. Better places for people. Just about in 2010, early 2010, when the movement has gained momentum, we started to discuss how do we effectively impact the world that we live in. So one of the key questions asked is, instead of impacting on the supply side, which means most of you are here representing that, where it be it development, design, construction. But the answer lies in the demand side. We feel that we need to cross the hurdle of the supply side to hit the demand side and effectively change mindsets about the adoption or uh, use of green buildings. So to reach the demand side, we had to rethink the language that we use. The language that we use such as kilowatt per meter, uh, per meter square hour and things like uh, solar panel, technical specification, don't quite cut it. Because if you walk out to the street now and talk to anyone, it will not be surprising to you that they look at you with a uh, questioning phase. So we have to change our language to one that they can understand effectively. And we came up with this uh, tagline called Better Places for People, which has evolved into a project that's globally uh, uh, implemented. The key to this is we are saying that buildings support healthier and happier lives for those who occupy them. Now initially this was a difficult message because when we discuss amongst us, the scientific and the industrial players, we are very concerned about data. But surprisingly, the members of the public begin to grasp it, begin to understand them, and didn't have too much difficulty to believe in that. Fortunately, our community has also started to develop data through research. I think you have read some of them. One of them is by UTC and Harvard on the improvement to health conditions and cognitive functions. I believe that in a short time, we will see more useful data to help convince people. The other key project that we worked on right now is called the Advancing Net Zero Project. In the last COP21 uh, meeting, World GBC together with uh, partners at the Buildings Day set the ambitious and audacious target of trying to achieve a lowering of our global warming to keep it within two degrees Celsius. And to that end, we came out with two very, very ambitious goals. Firstly, we said to all our members, let's build only net zero buildings, 100% of them by 2050. And secondly, we urge all GBCs to implement or to work with partners on net zero too by 2030. While we think that this is a dream, the reality is that more and more countries are beginning to ask questions as to how can we do that. So it is no longer about why, but actually it's about how. And we just released our net zero, advancing net zero report, which is available on our website for download. While it is a very ambitious target, we believe that this is a very important document that begins to reach to all industry players and potentially end users 
to understand why we need to do that. Now, this morning we have heard a lot of discussion about cities, and I don't need to further emphasize the challenges and problems that we face about cities. We know that cities produce a wonderful result or habitat for human beings. They equally produce a lot of challenges and problems. However, at the World Green Building Council, it took us quite a long time to want to explore into this realm of cities because our shirt name is called Green Building Council. So we have a tendency as confined by our name to look at buildings and buildings alone, and that's not good enough. I think we soon realized that the sum of the part is actually greater. So we now begin to feel that there's a need to actually look at spaces between buildings and the accumulation of buildings into cities, into settlements, and begin to ask questions as to how we can help accelerate the greening of larger settlements. So I'm very happy to hear that Hong Kong Green Building Council has developed your rating tool for districts. And I think other countries are also doing likewise. Now, just by doing environmental improvement to cities, I feel it's not good enough. Because oftentimes we achieve the result, but that is only the hardware. We need real ground-up involvement. We need the citizens to understand why they need to collectively work with industry and government to change our cities. The planning model of cities needs to be questioned. The old paradigm of a car-centric city needs to be challenged. We need to revisit a lot of fundamentals of how we live, work and play inefficiently in cities that are growing beyond our imagination and capability to cope. So one of the key things is go back to the fundamental, ask our questions, why we even build cities, and then re-examine what sort of ideal city we should have. It's not just about energy saving, it's not just about efficiency, but it's about people. So I'm very happy to hear that even in China, now the emphasis is about people-centric environment. So these are just some of the ideas that you will ask any layman, they will embrace it, they will agree with you. If you can get them on your side, I think we all have an easier step forward. With that, I conclude my five-minute presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ms. Young. We will come back to your main arguments during our roundtable discussion later. Now I'd like to hand over to our colleague Yu Wai Wang from China, from mainland. Please, here is a clicker, and yes, this one. First one, the first one. Okay. 我们领导也讲到了有这么三个方向开始向绿色生态城区发展 
。我们中国过去就在搞，我们过去叫建筑工业化，但是最近国家发的文件装装配式建筑，好像学术性的味道太强了一点。实际上就是把我们传统的给房子的方式转变成一种新的生产方式，我们简称叫。设计标准化、生产工厂化、施工机械化，我们把我们的产业链的结构变了。这主要是第一，中国的节能减排，政府非常重视。我们用传统的方法，大量的扬尘，使我们的节能减排不不利。第二，中国的劳动力市场发生了变化。过去我们一个农民工只要三百块一天，现在五百块都找不到。第三个节能减排直接要求我们要加速，所以我们出现了新的生产方式。当然，随着新的生产方式中，我们过去中国号称叫三千万建设大军，那么很多人的就业的问题可能会带来一个新的问题啊，他们就要下岗了，就不能老在这个建筑业里待着了。那么讲到我们的绿色建筑的。全生命周期，我们讲碳排放就要跟着走。我们大家知道，世界共识，绿色建筑的全生命周期，从建材的生产，到运输，到施工，到我们运行，到我们维修、拆迁、废弃物的处理，有七个阶段。我们现在讲到碳的排放，要紧紧的抓住运营的阶段。运营要占了整个碳排放的百分之八十到九十，我们做了很多案例的分析，差不多就在这个数。所以，我们目前讲到建筑的碳排放，希望大家第一步先把眼睛盯住了运营。当然，各个国家的运营的时间不一样。我们中国以建筑物的寿命五十年为周期，有的国家地区以四十年，有的国家以六十年。运营时间的长短占的比例就不一样啊。那么，我们中国绿建委在去年九月，在美国纽约有八个国家的联盟开了零碳建筑的会议。世界绿建委特意邀请中国跟美国参加了这个会议，因为中国跟美国是碳排放的老大佬，一定要参加。我们在这个会议上呢，发表了一些我们的建议想法。国际上对这个问题有不同的看法。美国称为叫 Net Zero Building， 你不信？我们中国呢还保守一点，我们现在就听到叫 Net Zero， 我们中国提出叫 Near Zero 啊，接近于零。一下子从建筑的能耗排放从原来这么大降到零，可能有一点困难。我们所以叫 Near。那么美国方面呢，强调是用可再生能源来充填这部分能耗，使它的碳排放为零。他们的专家强调是 onsite。我们中国目前实践的体会 ，onsite 是有一定困难。我们现在在建筑物上装了可再生能源，发现问题还是不少，价格、性能比，建筑的密度很大。城市的适用等等有，我总结了上次有十个方面的影响，所以中国现在目前的可再生能源，主要还是通过政府的大力度的发，比如说风力发电，我们中国政府建了重点地区的风力发电，我们的太阳能电就在沙漠地区，有的是土地，太阳能的辐射强度日照时间很长，所以这里面一个很重要的一个参数。我们叫碳排放因子，就是你每用一度电，它排放了多少二氧化碳。这个数据，大家在搞建筑全寿命周期、搞碳排放中，一定要紧紧抓住。我们中国政府重视能源结构的变化，所以我们这个数是不断的降小。像上海地区，本来我们中国很多年前，我记得这个数据是零点九，一个电一度电。排放零点九五公斤二氧化碳。现在上海地区可再生能源、山下的电、核电站的电给他，他一个千瓦时只用到了零点三亿公斤二氧化碳。可是我们北方天津用的火电
它可能目前一度电还是产生了零点六五公斤二氧化碳，所以大家在推那个零碳之后呢，要注意能源结构政府的大动作，比我们每一个人在单体建筑上去考虑装一个可再生能源，要问题大得多，意义深得多。那么我们中国绿建委呢，在会上表态要做三件事，第一件事。我们要编近零碳排放的技术导则，要跟上国际潮流。最近我们政府再次强调，李克强总理在德国时候，尽管美国推出了，中国肯定跟欧盟要扛起这个责，把气候变化的责任要承担下来。所以我们要对我们中国新的建筑编那个零碳、近零碳的技术导则。第二，我们先要把我们国内做的案例好的。北方地区、中部地区、南方地区，把办公建筑、新建的、既有建筑改造的，找十二个案例先汇编出来，给大家去启发，到底这个建筑怎么样搞到近零碳建筑？第三个，世界绿建协会准备培养七千个人才进去，我们中国想培养超过一千个人，先把让让他们掌握这方面的工作，这是绿建委近期的工作。那么刚才我讲到了，我们一份标准叫“绿色生态城区评价标准”。大家都知道，中国政府对生态文明建设作为一个国策在那里对的。所以“生态”两个字，在我们搞环保、搞绿色中怎么去理解呢？我想把我们中国人的理解跟大家做一个介绍。首先，生态的环境是四大环境：大气环境、地表水环境。地下水环境、土壤环境，目前老百姓最敏感的大气环境 PM 二点五特别严重，大家都没人买了口罩，就一百块、两百块戴了。但是我想告诉我们中国的专家预测，中国政府这么重视大气环境的治理，我们的专家预测，十几年功夫，中国可以把这个问题解决。我就举一个例子，最近把京津冀地区的采暖。把它过去用锅炉烧煤全部停下来，没给气，没给电，这个动作很大，马上受到很好的效果。我们严重的是水环境的污染，我们很多地区老百姓喝的水都是不健康的水。可是最最突出的问题，土壤的污染，是中国最难治理。我们欠的债最多，由于我们过去对这个问题不重视。中国政府环保费用的百分之一才用来土壤治理，先进发达国家都用百分之三十的钱来治理土壤，所以我们国务院马上要出台这部分的文件，要对土壤治理要开始加强。我们生物的三个要素，动物、植物，还有大家没想到维生素啊，所以对生态，我今天用这个时间跟大家做一个介绍。最后。我们在这生态中有三个突出的问题，也做一个介绍。生态中跟我们中国发展有问，跟着发展的一个是热岛效应。由于中国城市发展高密度，建筑的高密度，人口密度也非常高。刚才早上讲到香港的人口密度，我看到了每平方公里两万七千三百三人。我们中国上海有两个区都超过四万人呢、啊。在这么多人生长在这块土地上，它的热岛效应肯定很厉害。这就是我们生态中的一些问题。现在在我们新的绿色建筑标准里，特别强调了热岛效应的问题。第二问题，通风廊道。由于我们 PM 二点五一来就指望起风，一起风就把 PM 五给刮走，所以对城区的通风廊道又提到一个非常高的问题。大家知道，我们的武汉是非常热的城市。由于它属于通风廊道的建设，现在每年可以降低一到两度。德国的慕尼黑，我们看到资料也是搞通风廊道，所以现在中国城市规划建设中对通风廊道的建设高度的重视。当然，生态环境里面最后一个问题是噪声的问题啊，这是牵到以人为本。我们过去不注意，现在我们的噪声问题、噪声环境又提到非常高的高度来。这是我们生态中发展的三问题，时间关系
啊，因为五分钟的时间，我留一段片子，就把我们发展中的几个问题跟大家做介绍。错误地方欢迎大家指正，好吧？谢谢 ，You by Wang. And now I hand over to the voice of the practitioners and the construction industry, our colleague Brian Liu. Please start your presentation. Hi, can you hear me? Um, I'm, a, I'm a practitioner, so I'm always very concerned on how to make things happen. And I think most of you here, are here we, spent, we spent three days here, very valuable time, and you're here for one thing, you want to make changes. You want to make the world a better place, a more greener place, you want to change the building, uh, the way you build things, the way you design things. So change. What is another word for change? Is adaptation. So when I talk about adaptation, I want to talk about a little story that, about this little thing. This device, this year marks the 10th anniversary of launching of the iPhone. Right? You all have one, maybe you have an Android. This particular device, if you look at this, uh, it was launched in the year 2007. And by this year, they have sold 143 million units. And it is the greatest fastest adapted technology in the world, the world ever seen. If you think about this way, three years, it killed Nokia. Five years, it killed BlackBerry. How does it happen? Three things, three pillars. Um, first thing, the technology, the processing power. Uh, Moore's Law, I don't know if you know about this. Uh, uh, Gordon Moore, right, the founder of Intel, one of them, he said the chip performance would double every 18 months. And this is a general uh, ch chart from 1900 all the way to 2000. And you can see very consistent pattern. The iPhone 7. One iPhone 7 equals to 3,300 and more of your Apple IIe. Just think about that. How much processing power you have hold in your hand. But it's not just there. Just iPhone itself has six sensors. You have your proximity sensor, your ambient light sensor, motion sensor, moisture sensor, gyroscope, and my Garmin watch can read my pulse. This is changing very quickly. The sensor getting smarter, smaller, more accurate, and more data is being fed into the system. Another pillar, capacity and connectivity. By having your phone is not just enough. By having a 3G, 4G network and the cloud computing, all of a sudden you have access to information uh, through Google and also all your entire personal history data, right? Through your phone, your, all your photographs can access online. And the third and most powerful aspect of this three pillar is the open source and knowledge sharing. Now, we all know about this sort of open source software. You can download it, code it. In fact, if you want to do an AI, artificial intelligence, the whole deep learning code algorithm is free, download online. Any one of you can access that. And it is through this change. We no longer need to ship our cake, our car to somewhere else. We're sharing recipes. People can start accessing this knowledge, this data, and you can, once you have it, you are empowered to create change, to adapt it to your local context. And I believe that these three convergence allow the smartphone to be extremely user-centric. You know, a two-year-old can use it, but not only that, all of a sudden, the adaptation becomes possible. Now, looking into our green building, this is the data from uh, lead and energy stuff. It's pretty bad, right? 88% non-certified building. We have a long way to go. And my, what I believe is we have spent the last 15, 20 years working really hard on how do you label green buildings, right? How do you measure it? And every now, I think every advanced country, advanced economic zone have your data measured. Right, we're very good. We all have our own green uh, labeling system. But the problem is this. The end user, your, your, my, my general colleague, anybody who rent your space, going into the building, that's a disconnect. Right? 
If you're a real estate developer, maybe there's a relevance. If you're a tenant or you're an owner or a renter, you may have a relevance as a user. I don't feel it, I don't get to use, I don't get to choose it. What's in it for me? That's a huge disconnect. So can this green building miracle happen? That's my real question today. I want to challenge you to really think about that. Basing on this three pillar, I believe we're about to go through some dramatic changes. Let's talk about technology again. Uh, not only just on your phone, now we have wearable technology, we have small sensor that can sense how much ambient light you have received today. What is the general IAQ that you're exposing? What's your schedule like today? Can all these data now converge into an analytic program that creating smarter buildings? Smarter buildings that can tell you where you should be working today because you're not feeling so well, you need more fresh air. Or maybe you, um, today I'm working alone, I have no meetings, I can go to a, a different space within the building. We need smart buildings to start telling us, informing the end user, not just the designer, not just the developer, but people who are actually using these buildings and make a relevance, something that can help them to make their life a little better. Now, the other thing is capacity. I'm not talking about just a memory capacity. The, the autonomous car, I think in Singapore, it's already have a small area that already implemented this. And on the right, there's two diagrams here that Audi actually published. And they're saying that if your car has automatic parking, not driving, just parking, the all 12 vehicle, they can park it much more efficiently. And then the other two thirds of the land can be used something else. Just think about the impact on the land resource. All of a sudden, we have an extremely abundant amount of land resource that would come out. You no longer need parking spaces, you no, no longer need roadside parking space. Because of this potential economic value, people are willing to redevelop their buildings. This is uh, a concert that happened, one single concert happened in the uh, end of last year by a singer called Wang Fei, which is one of the most famous uh, Chinese contemporary pop singer. She did one live concert in Shanghai, and within that stadium, they have 10,000 people watched it. But what's more amazing is there's 21.5 million people watch it online live streaming. And you're willing to pay 30 RMB, which is about $4 US, get on your VR goggle, front row seat, you can turn your head and experience the entire concert. It's 88,000 doing it. Then the question is, how big of a stadium do you need for these concerts? It's a, maybe a 10 people intimate space, is that enough? Or we need bigger scale? So we are questioning the capacity of these performances just through technology. Augmented reality, a lot of you know about it. How do you, can we it help us to make decisions better, help us to uh, understand the scenario better? Uh, Real-time visualization. I don't know if you're familiar with this Beam robots. Uh, in Stanford, they already use it. They have tried having meetings over it. I simply throw the question out. Do we really need to fly 10,000 miles? Look at the carbon footprint just flying here. Maybe you have some, not every, some people can come here, but maybe someone can just meet virtually. This is already happening. And the last one is the open source uh, knowledge sharing base, which I think is the most important part of our discussion. We understand that in an open source house, you can download any plans you want, any construction details you want, make it affordable. But what's the impact of that? It's we share the recipe again. The recipe, it's important because it tells us how to use it, but most importantly, it empower you to adapt these changes. It empower you to make fine tuning to fit the local culture, to fit the local construction of, uh, uh, regulation, and fit the local climate. Right? Every city has their own idiosyncrasy. And the key is how can we use this knowledge to fine tune the design, fine tune the building, fine tune our best practices. All the research we have done, huge amount of data set, can we create a better platform for us to share these data, this performance data, best practices data? Because only then we can really create an adaptation that we want to see. And I, I do feel that this conversion of these three pillars is upon us. And I hope that 2017 will be the year that marks such changes that so that 
We no longer have to pull so hard about government regulation, but we create the demand. We tell the market the demand for why green building matters. And I hope to see that um, from here on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brian. And now I invite my colleague from ETH Zürich, Arno, to take over. Thank you very much. My microphone on. Can you hear me? Now it should work. All right. Thank you very much. So I hope you can uh, take one more. Um, I'm very happy to present today a little bit insight about our work as, as researchers and precisely about the, the challenges we experience, not only from research, but also from putting research into practice. So I, I dubbed my little presentation with uh, the title Three Grand Challenges, and uh, we will just start right away with the first one. So we heard a couple of times today that we require that we need efficient systems and technology to supply our buildings efficiently with heat, cold, uh, water, power. And we also heard that we need to use local renewable energy sources, such as solar, waste, for example. Um, but in, in fact, this means that these systems span over multiple domains, multiple technical domains, and the entire life cycle. It also spans across different scales. We start at the component level, and it basically ends up at the city level. It means that if we want to build these buildings that have these capacities and are close to near, near zero or even zero emissions and zero energy, we have to think about increasingly sophisticated systems behind it. And sophistication comes at a certain cost and a certain challenge. First of all, we have a higher risk of failure and errors in design, um, which leads to the well-known performance gap then afterwards that our buildings actually not perform the way they are supposed to. We have to think of different ways and different methods and tool sets how to deal with this complexity. And of course, we have to think about the knowledge of the people involved from the very construction worker to the engineer to the person that actually operates those systems. So if we can summarize the challenge on complexity is how do we design, build, and operate increasingly complex, efficient yet robust and resilient systems over these multiple scales? And the question is, do we need more smart systems, or do we need smart people to deal with this? In other words, do we need better technology or better education, or maybe both? The second you could call human in the loop. What we do is we research on highly efficient building systems, but sometimes in this whole technical field and technology, we forget that actually buildings are for humans. We spend most of our times of our lives inside of them. Very often, high-performance buildings are optimized solely for energy performance, not really acknowledging comfort, well-being, um, and how people yeah, feel the best inside and even outside of buildings, as exterior comfort is also increasingly necessary. We have recent studies that show very nicely the dependency between the condition of the indoor environment and human performance and well-being, especially related, for example, to CO2. Comfort is still dealt with very much as a technical matter, um, not such much as a social or cultural matter. In current building systems as we plan it are actually not really capable and able to address this different comfort that is really individual. So the challenge remains, how do we learn, how do we see the occupant, how do we respond with our systems? How do we create environments that adapt and learn from the humans they're actually built for? And then on the life cycle, of course, how do we design buildings and building systems that are flexible, expandable, and fit for change over the entire life cycle? It is not used to make a system that only lasts for the last next five years. Especially if we think about digital technologies, there's a huge challenge for us how to make this more sustainable. And finally, one thing I believe is very relevant is that we have to think about new models. When we try to put our research in practice, it is quite clear that knowledge without considering the implementation has no impact. So we need to look beyond just technological solutions. We have to recognize and realize the characteristics of the built environment, such as large scale, long life cycle, and a very strong risk aversion. So if we don't understand the fundamental, fundamental economic mechanisms behind it, it is very hard to overcome this. 
We have to leverage these mechanisms and eventually change them. This especially concerns retrofit, where many, many constraints apply. So the, the big challenge in this is how do we make efficient solutions economically viable? Not only invent technology, but find something, new business models that are able to leverage these technologies over the entire life cycle. And more importantly, how can we find cross-benefits for implementing those new approaches? Combine energy with other features, for example, better utilization, increased comfort, better utilization of space, for example. And how can we leverage this on a large scale? So with this, I'd like to conclude. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. So thank you, gentlemen. Now I invite you to take a place over there, and we will start our short discussion. It's a very special exercise to discuss the most important question of the world in 10 minutes, but we will do our very best to find appropriate answers. So, ladies and gentlemen, let me start with one of the first questions, and I especially like to invite uh, Li Xiang and uh, perhaps also Arno to think about the first answers. So it seems to me several decades ago, the Beatles tried to convince us to live in yellow submarines. In our days, we tried to convince the people to live in green buildings. But how to convince people if we talk every day about resource depletion, environmental pollution, dangerous substances. So what about the beauty of a building? What about the social and cultural value? What about happiness and user satisfaction? So what are your ideas to convince people to promote green buildings? Perhaps you will start a campaign in your organization. So please, from my point of view, you should have a certain position to this question. Yeah. Well, can you hear me? Yeah. When I took over as chair. In fact, before taking over as chair of World Green Building Council, I asked, I gave myself this one challenge. <clears throat> Assuming that we have no more time to rescue this planet, and we must do one thing and one thing only to turn the tide. I think, as uh, Brian said, tipping point. What can that tipping point look like? I soon came to a conclusion that it's not the building industry. We can't, on our own, green everything. And the answer is very obvious. I think you, Brian gave a fantastic presentation about getting the users to turn the tide. So is it possible to do it like iPhones or phones? I think also it's very difficult because phone producers uh, create millions of phones, all identical at the same time. But buildings are built one at a time by different players. So how do we then uh, get people to resonate with the need for change. I think we have to work at the settlement scale. A small town won't cut it. Today, we are talking about cities. The only way forward is to make sure that the whole citizen group do it collectively. And that's why I said you have to have the citizens understand the need, the government provide the leadership, the industry provide the engine. These three parties come together, then I think we have a chance. So, Arno, you like to add something? No, oh, it's basically, for me, it goes in a similar direction. I think one, one very relevant uh, fact, and that have, we have learned with the buildings, the prototypical buildings we installed, is to actually inform people what is happening and to make it visual what is actually going on. For example, how certain properties evolve within a, in a, in a space, the CO2 values, for example. And one thing that we, we learned is that people really like this aspect of being able to interact with the building in a different way. So, so we, we had studies where we compared the thermal performance or the thermal comfort of the previous office with the new office, and it was very clear that the participants all liked being able to influence their own personal climate in a way, um, and, and this had huge consequences on the overall rating and we had very interesting discussions about what is the appropriate CO2 level in space. Uh, should it be, shouldn't it be zero or should it be 600? So this comes as a side effect. It is an, an education about what is happening in indoor environments and what are maybe relevant values, how to feel comfortable. Um, this, is, this is one thing that we've learned to be, uh, put people in the situation that you actually, actually interact with those type of buildings. 
Yes, and I think, Ryan, this was your main message. Yes, how new technologies can help us to uh, operate the building in a much more better way. No, I think like, like what he just said, you know, uh, uh, once you provide data, it's very interesting. Right? I've seen so many people wearing the Fitbit just to counting steps. Right? So for instance, can we measure how much water you use every day and then share it on social media and we compete? Right? I know the Secretary of Environment for Hong Kong, he compete his electricity bill with the ex uh, head of a Hong Kong observatory. So these competitions foster community and foster, foster best practices. So I do believe that having data and make those data available to the common user and then empowering them, I think that's a good model to create demand because if we just try to make the change without creating demand, that's always very difficult. And, and that's where I think just empowerment with, with information, I think we are at the verge of that, that uh, convergence, the tipping point. So, but I think there are not just new uh, technologies supporting us to operate the building and to inform the users, there are also new ideas to create the building. So perhaps you, Yubai Wang, can tell us more about the Chinese approach to uh, improve the production of new buildings. What is your strategy to improve the quality of buildings and the national building stock? Um. 早上苏市长已经把这个问题讲到我认为还比较强势了是计划经济跟市场经济相结合的推动其他国家我摸了一下基本上都是靠市场经济第一个原因就是计划经济跟市场经济来推我们一定要把人的思想人的理念提高发展的质量等等还要继续提高这么一个背景 Okay, thank you So it was a very important argument to think about the main actors in this field So in a certain way we have to jump from the supply side to the demand side It's not just about to think about new technologies We must also identify the actors willing to ask for such technologies and willing to pay for such technologies. So from my point of view, it's also a question, do we give the right people the right training? So it's not just to train about the designers and the construction engineers. In a certain way, we have also to train the developers and in a certain way, also the politicians. What are your experience? What is, in your point of view, the most important target group to promote, let us say, more sustainable development on different levels, construction, product industry, building stock, or national campaigns. What are the main target groups we can go through? And I'd like to ask you for your experience. So, so in, in our experience, uh, the, the, the stakeholders are actually really well educated in, the, in their concerns, not necessarily about the green building. 
uh, because that is something that for at least the, the developers we talk to matters only if the client explicitly wants it. So but what we've learned, what is very, very powerful, if you, if you show that a green building has other benefits and has this type of cross benefits um, that allow like developers and, and, and uh, real estate people to actually invest in that. And at the end, it is then also sustainable. So for us, it was very interesting to see that this provides a very good incentive if you, you can supply, for example, better quality of space, better utilization, uh, interaction, for example, for the, the actual tenant and the client. And then, yes, at the end, this building is also very efficient. I think that is an experience we made in Singapore, which, which uh, for us was actually the most successful way of talking about that. You're asking a chicken and egg situation. And I think the only way to solve a chicken egg is you have the chicken and the egg at the same time, but you never know who comes first. So I think on the legislative government side, we need to push it as far as we can. And at the same time, we need to create the demand. So until that, these two things balance off, uh, it's always going to be a struggle. So, but uh, once again, I think I have hope in, in seeing where all the work that has been done in the last 20 years, it's about to reach the tipping point. So I guess my, I'm still very hopeful, but it, it requires, I think, a slightly more innovation on the engagement of the users, uh, the common users, not just the professionals. I think that's where uh, the, 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 the last chain that can work. 刚才的问题听清楚了没有它到底能耗是大是小我们要用大数据说话有点吃惊了你就说你这种房子到底省能了没有yeah, there are two key words that really drive the campaign. One, uh, I resonate with Prof Wang that talks about savings. So the two key words are money and health. Uh, need not explain any further about green buildings. So I didn't even talk about green buildings, but if you talk to a layman about money and health, they all understand it. So I think green buildings must reach a point where it saves you money. It saves developer money, save the whole industry chain money. But in the... The reason why we're not seeing that is because globalization, urbanization took place rapidly in the last 10 years. We've never seen cities grow the way it is. Real estate value rise to a point of unmanageable level. So people don't think about savings, but I think we reach a tipping point because uh, Asia, for example, hit the bubble. Most of the cities are struggling to see that rise in value further. So maybe it's timely to ask ourselves, 
can we develop and save? Health. With urbanization, cities are getting worse in terms of health levels. In fact, in China, the reason why green building is now so positive because of pollution. I mean, we don't want to talk about pollution, but honestly speaking, I never see China so love green buildings until the pollution level rise to a point where it is unbearable. So now all citizens will like to live in a green building but because of that. More, so so I think okay. those are the two key words that we should continue to work on and uh, improve lives. Okay, thank you for this. And we can learn out of the situation in a certain way. There is a certain metaphor. If we try to solve the problems of the world, we have to speed up. You know, we have already achieved the final point of this roundtable discussion. It, it was very short, but you know, to make a success, we must translate our ideas in the language of the decision makers. And we have different ways to measure success. For one, it's the economic benefit, but for the other, it's user satisfaction or to achieve national targets. So we have different success factors. So I hope if you are ready, to, you are able to show us the result on the survey. If there is a slide, please show this now. There was a question one, and I hope you are able to use the online voting system. And it will also be a surprise to me if there is a result. So we will wait, and you can see 5% like to highlight. It's very important for a while to concentrate on aspects of climate change, but most of the participants will stay to the concept of the overall sustainability approach to deal in parallel and on equal level with economic, social, and environmental aspects. And if you ask me, I'm really happy about this result if we are able to stay to the overall picture of sustainability. There is just one answer, I think. So, no, you are good enough to answer also the other. So the system works, and I'm happy about this. So it was, uh, what is the final purpose for sustainability assessment systems? And most of you are voting for version D. Public authorities should incorporate this into codes and regulations. This is also a good signal that we have to combine both forces, the forces of the free market and the leadership by government. And of course, it's a good idea to integrate this into codes and regulations. And by the way, there was a message by insurance companies and final institutions around the world that in the areas of health and environmental protection, governments should overtake the responsibility to come out with the limits and goals, and so it's a good idea to incorporate this into standards. And perhaps the final question was question number three. If there is a result. So, Question was, it's uh, equal weighting, and most of you are voting for equal uh, weighting, followed by environmental aspects. Th there is no surprise, because this is the basis. It was the basis, but in our days, it's on equal weighting. But of course, the environment is our precondition for our daily life, and so it's not a mistake to vote with A. But I really like to thank you. It was very interesting to see your answers. And this is also a way to invite you to take part here in a discussion like our discussion was a short one, but an interesting one. So I'd like to jump back to my other slides to have a look to the final slides to give a short summary now. So what we have learned is uh, that we must find a way also to promote the advantages of green or sustainable buildings and cities, cities and buildings as a place to live and work. And we must convince people by good arguments, but also showing the quality of buildings. And so you, we are able to come back to the idea high performance building, which means, let us say, also high quality for the end user. In a certain way, there is much more to see. 
If you go to the literature, there are mega trends for construction industry, and you can see our mega trends, sustainability requirements, and resilience challenges are surrounded by a lot of other very important topics like society and workforce, policies and regulation, and market and consumers. There are very important fields of activity in the construction industry, transformation network, but again, it's uh, very important to, to develop new business models, but also to use uh, forces of the government, especially to use green public or sustainable public procurement. And I think this is a good message for you. If we are clever enough during the next years, the construction industries and the designers are, get the chance to become something like a double winner of the climate change because the transformation of the whole building stock, this will create business, this will create jobs, and you can make money with green buildings. From my point of view, a very good message. So let us try to become double winners. It's now the idea to hand over to Roundtable 2, takes part tomorrow, putting ideas into actions. So please learn more about the actions tomorrow in the afternoon, chaired by my colleague, Ms. Lowe. And you see all the faces of the participants tomorrow in the afternoon, so please come back and you can see how our ideas will lead to some actions. Thank you, thank you to our four participants. Shei <laughs> to all of you, thank you for coming and taking part. I wish you longevity and happiness. I like to say goodbye. And now it's my task to remember you. You have from now 10 minutes to move to the next session. And during this, let us sing together the famous butterfly song to move up to the next level of session. Please start the music now. <laughs>